Good morning. This morning, I would like to talk about uncertainties when assessing the impact of climate change on water resource management, and in particular, in earth system models. First, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, in particular, uh, Ruby Leung, Teklu Tesfa, and then Mao Yi Wang, uh, Ying Liu, and Hong Yili, all from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So first, the context. We have earth system models, like we talked this morning, and within those earth system models, there is the land surface scheme that is taking care of the uh, fluxes and mass exchanges between the atmosphere and the land surface. What we've been doing um, uh, recently is that we built an uh, irrigation model and a reservoir model so that we would improve the representation of anthropogenic uh, activities on the, uh, on the natural water and energy cycles. So we have irrigation uh, and the crop model that interacts with the reservoir model that is going to take care of the extraction for irrigation and other domestic use and industrial, and also the regulation. So they all interact together. And um, like any other reservoir model, um, there are operation rules. The question was, um, for this analysis, once you put the greenhouse gases and in a climate change context, do we need to adapt operations for climate change impact assessment and how should we uh, change them? So in order to answer this question, I will uh, try to answer a couple of intermediate questions. First, well, how is anthropogenic effect simulated in earth system models with the understanding that an earth system model is at a much larger scale than a watershed model. Uh, what is the current model performance? What, and once we optimize the releases for future period, uh, what is the impact of climate change? And what would it have been if we didn't uh, optimize the releases? And then I want to emphasize what is the difference between optimization and adaptation. So first, how is anthropogenic effect simulated? So here's the modeling framework. First, you start with climate forcing. Uh, temperature, precipitation, water demand is going to uh, be influenced by the climate forcing. Irrigation, uh, domestic for heating and cooling, industrial, mining, livestock. Um, and this is going to feed into our water resource management model. On the other side, uh, the climate forcing is also uh, impacting the uh, energy and water cycle, the natural state. So here we are forcing our land surface scheme and we are deriving the runoff to be routed. So those two, the runoff and the demand, are forcing our water resource management model. And then we derive the regulated flow and the water supply. So here is the trick. In, uh, in a usual watershed model, the reservoir models are based on objective functions. For example, you need to minimize the water supply deficit. You need um, to uh, minimize um, uh, some uh, other criteria for recreation and environmental concerns. They can be either objective functions or they can be constraints. Also, you can give different weights to your different objectives. So those are the operating rules, the different curves. Then you usually force this reservoir system with the flow, and that's how you optim opti uh, optimize the releases. Into an earth system model, you want to run the continental or global scale at once. So you cannot enter all of those different objectives uh, for each individual reservoir. So you need to simplify it. So what we did is we built a different water resource management model where the operating rules are well simplified. Each reservoir is, um, has got its own rules that are depending on the reservoir purpose. It's going to be irrigation or flood control. If it's hydropower or um, uh, navigation, it's going to be in the flood control pool. The operations are very close at the scale that we are interested in. And um, then we are going to um, make it dependent on the mean annual flow and the long-term mean monthly demand. So I want you to see this not as a forcing, but as operating rules. 
So the reservoir operating rules, which is the equivalent of your objective functions and your constraints, which in the end are shaping your releases, well, here we're using gen generic equation based on the long-term mean monthly demand and the long-term mean monthly natural flow. So this is going to be our optimizing system. How does it look like? Well, here's an example for Grand Coulee. Uh, if it's used for irrigation, the pattern of the release is a bell shape where you're going to hold in and get storage in the, uh, at the beginning of the year so that you can fill up that reservoir and then do releases here during the irrigation season. If it was for flood control only, the, um, um, the release target is the mean annual flow. Here is um, what is the current performance of that simplified system. Uh, this is the application of the Columbia River Basin where here we're using all of the reservoir, we're simulating all of them based on the iCold and Grand database. You have in yellow, um, you have the reservoir that are only for flood control or other users, but not irrigation. So you have the large reservoir here in, uh, in Canada. And the, um, the size of the round is for the capacity of the reservoir. In green, you're going to have uh, the reservoir for irrigation and other users, but not flood control. And what we did is that we improved those release targets for a combination of irrigation and flood control. So that's what you have in blue. And what we're going to do is really look at the uh, climate change impact at three locations, uh, Grand Coulee for the north, uh, the upper Columbia, Brownlee for the snake, and then at the regional scale at the Dales. So first, let's look at the flow. What we're looking at here in this upper panel is uh, the long-term historical uh, mean monthly flow. The, the dashed lines here, the dashed dark line is the observed naturalized flow. The uh, dashed gray line is our simulated natural flow, so without the water resource management model. Then we applied the reservoir model and we have the blue line so this is our simulated regulated flow, and the solid black line is our observed regulated flow. So we do have an, uh, um, a small underestimation, but we do capture pretty well at the regional scale the effect of regulation and extraction on the flow. Um, and here you have a time series. In terms of reservoir storage, here we're looking at, uh, at the reservoir storage at Grand Coulee, and you see how they do flood control and irrigation. The black line is the observed uh, storage where they drop the reservoir before the spring snow melt and then they um, keep it constant for the remaining of the year. And with our um, generic equations, we were able to have that same drop down and then fill up that reservoir and then maintain it while providing water for irrigation. So here you have the drop. There is some more work, uh, future work to improve the uh, interannual variability. We do have interannual variability, but we could improve it with some knowledge of the snowpack. But what's important is that we are capturing the pattern presently. And another aspect of the validation is the water supply deficit. So we saw that the input into the water resource management model was the runoff, and the other one is the demand. So that's what you have on the left. Here we're using the USGS conceptive water use. There is a lot of uncertainty in the demand, so here we decided to use uh, the observed consumptive use, uh, and the units are in million cubic meter per year. So you can see the upper, uh, the Columbia Valley, and the Snake River Basin, and the Willamette over here. On the right, what you have is our simulated water supply deficit. So this is the unmet demand, and this is mostly over the Snake. Uh, at the basin scale, we have a 2.5% uh, supply deficit. It means that we, don't meet, we do not meet that demand. Uh, but we were using observed demand. Well, we need to take into account that this 2.5% is really taking into account our assumption in our model that we do not take, um, we do not use groundwater. So this is based on surface water. Um, so now, if we put it into a climate change context, um, so what we're going to do is we need to optimize the reservoir releases the same way other reservoir models would do. You have uh, operating rules, but they're going to optimize um, 
the, the flow. So here, something equivalent would be to use uh, the future water demand so that we have a long-term mean monthly demand and also for the flow. So those are optimized reservoir operating rules. And this is the context, this is the setup that makes it equivalent to other uh, reservoir model that have objective functions and they're going to optimize it for the future flow. So the question is, what is the effect of the optimization on, those, um, on the impact assessment? So case number one, this is our baseline, this is the case on the left. We have the historical case where we're using the historical demand and the runoff, uh, simulated runoff. We're forcing the water management model with operating rules calibrated for the air historical conditions. <laughs> um, case number two is the same thing where we're using uh, increased demand. There's a l large uncertainty in the demand. So here, arbitrarily, we uh, multiply it by 1.5. And here we're using A2, which is a pessimistic scenario, and B1, which is opt optimistic. We forced the land surface scheme and we provided the runoff. And here we're forcing the water management model with optimized role for future condition. So if you compare those two outputs, this is the impact assessment. And if we do the same, case number three, we're using the same system, but with a water management model where the operating rules are still the one from the historical case. Well, we have another impact assessment, and the difference between the two will be the effect of optimization. So now let's look again at the other results. Uh, well, first, look at uh, the impact of climate change on natural flow. What we see is that we have a shift, shift in peak toward uh, earlier spring, and we also have a slight annual flow increase, like you can see here, this is the mean annual, the mean monthly flow at the Dells. Uh, blue is uh, historical, and the bright colors, orange and uh, red, is for future. And at the Dells, we have an increase in flow. Uh, at Grand Coulee, we do have also an increase in flow, but at um, Brownlee, it's, there is more, there is a larger range. What does it mean for the optimizing rules? Well, if we increase the mean annual flow for the bell shape, it means that here we're going to increase the release. And the same thing with flood control uh, reservoir, it means that we're going to increase the release. So we have increased releases. What does it mean for the regulated flow? Here we also have the same hydrograph, but for regulated flow, uh, we have a smaller increase in flow. We have here again a smaller increase in mean annual flow. And for the uh, Brownlee, it's actually further decreased the flow. So we have reduced increase or, uh, or decrease in annual regulated flow. What does it mean on the water supply deficit? Here we're looking at the mean monthly water supply deficit. So over the entire basin for the future, the bright colors is for the historical rules, the non-optimized. And yes, the dark colors are for the optimized rules. So we have um, supply deficit for B1 and A2 that is increasing. Um, so increased water supply deficit. Um, I'm going to go just quickly on this. It's just to show what is the impact on the uh, spatial variability. If just pay attention over here, over the snake, and right here. Okay. So that's where things are happening. So um, just a summary of what we have been looking at here. Over the Upper Columbia, we have higher mean annual flow. It drove to higher releases. What I don't have time to show is that even though we have a higher release, those higher releases have been helping in uh, optimizing flood control. So this is here our storage with the drop down before the snow melt. And the bright colors are up. It means that we are spilling and we are flooding. But with the optimized rules, we actually are going uh, more down. So this is good. but there is a higher supply deficit. So there is good, there is bad. For the lower mean annual flow over the snake, we had lower release, and so we had higher supply deficit. So, conclusion. Do we need to adjust reservoir operation for climate change assessment in Earth system model? And the answer is yes, but in two steps. Optimization and adaptation. So, we started with rules that were dependent on the long-term demand inflow and reservoir rules. Once you put the optimization, we, see, we saw that it was good for flood control. So we need to optimize using the future demand and the future inflow. But warning, 
optimization, the word can be misleading because there are different objectives. So here, it didn't mean lower supply deficit, but it means adapted water control for the future flow. Uh, and that comes back to the different weight between the different objectives. Uh, and for adaptation, what we need to do is we need to adapt the rules like you will need to do for all of the uh, regular reservoir models. But the way to adapt it is, uh, so you have the optimization part here that will help with the flood control. But we need to have new rules that takes into account the changes in flow and demand toward a shape that will help mitigating. So with this, I would like to thank you. And also thanks uh, Prima and uh, the platform for regional integrated modeling and analysis and the integrated earth system model. Thank you. <laughs>